I'm Kim Beaton, and this video is going to be showing you all the techniques, the tricks of using very simple materials like hot glue, tin foil, and an outdoor clay called Paltaya to build something this wonderful. So, check out our video. Thank you. Paltaya is a clay that allows you to sculpt something and place it outdoors. These are the array of tools that you'll need to be able to start and finish a sculpture just like that. To start with, you'll need tin foil, ordinary kitchen appliance tin foil. You're going to need a hot glue gun and hot glue, a water bottle. This will keep your clay moist while you're working with it, mixing bowl, a screen. This is if you're going to be doing some super fine detail. This allows you to take some of the fibers out of Paltaya and make a softer, creamier mix. You need gloves because working with the clay can really dry your hands out. We have a fork. Please don't borrow your mom's best silver. Just an ordinary fork is fine. We have a rubber kidney. Rubber kidneys are fabulous for getting round, sweeping, organic forms pair of scissors. Sometimes paltaya acts just like fabric and scissors are what you can use to cut it. Brush for texturing. A very small dental tool. This is for very, very delicate details. A palette knife, often used for oil painting, but it's a really good sculpting tool. You can see it's spring steel. It has a lot of beautiful movement to it. This is a larger version of it. This is a concrete trowel. This is for doing very big sculptures. It's, it's a lot stiffer and it's a lot stronger. You're going to need a water container, a nice cloth on hand to keep your hands clean, and this. This is my Kenwood chef. This is a 30-year-old beast, and I have put 1,500 pounds of clay through this kitchen mixer alone. So I suggest if you want to do a lot of sculpting, get one of these things. You can usually find them either on Trade Me or Craigslist. And a towel. This towel is to drape over the mixer. You want to keep your dust down. This is, after all, your kitchen. Um, these are all the tools that you'll be needing to start and finish a sculpture. To build our dragon skull, we're going to have to start off with a basic core. Paltaya works because it's a very thin skin, about a quarter of an inch thick or about five mil thick over the surface of something. It doesn't need any more strength than that to be able to handle outdoors. So we don't want to waste a lot of the material just filling up the inside where you can't see it. So we're going to build out most of the structure with just tin foil, glued together with hot glue. To start off with, we're going to put on gloves. Now the reason for this is hot glue guns are hot. You can get some pretty serious burns on them, and this is a way to prevent them being too serious at all. Tin foil. First, snack off quite a few of these. That'll give you something to work with. Now when crumpling tin foil, you want that to be as filled with air as possible. You want that to be light and fluffy because you want this to accommodate as much room as possible because this stuff is free. Essentially, the air inside of it is very cost effective. I'm going to hot glue that down. Now, the next sheet. Again, keep it fluffy, keep a lot of air. And press that against this one and pull it off. And you'll notice there's a slight flattening. Only glue where it's going to touch. Don't waste glue going someplace else. It usually takes just a few seconds for that to glue together. Like that. Again, only where it's going to touch. I'm going to start to build out the shape. I'm going to put the nose into this corner and the horn kind of sweeping away this way. So I'll build out a rough shape into the point of this nose. This is going to take a whole lot of tin foil. Now there's one other thing. Since I'm doing an elevated horn that's going to be cantilevered off the body, I'm going to, I'd am going like a little extra support inside of that. This is a harmless cardboard box. This harmless cardboard box that held our tinfoil is going to be used as an interior support system. Now you don't need any additional stuff like tape 
what we're going to do is we're going to cut this, fold it till it becomes a triangle, and then hot glue it down to our board. I'm move that there. Trim these so it lets it fold. I want a triangle. I'm going to score that so it will fold against the ribs. Like that. We're going to lay a whole bunch of hot glue right along that edge until it cures. There we go. There. Now I have a rigid, strong shape. So I've got an anchor of this. I'm going to add a little bit more hot glue under this tin foil. And that looks about right. Yeah, that looks good. Put a lot of glue on this one. And then I'm going to slowly encapsulate this whole thing and really give it an excellent ground. Again, start ripping off a lot of sheets of tin foil because you're going to need 20 or 30 of these. Great thing about tin foil is you can genuinely sculpt it. It doesn't just go on as a block. You can do a tapered edge. So if I want this to be a bulk and I want it to smooth up, I literally make the tin foil like that. And you can see suddenly you have something that tapers as effectively as clay. The moment you pick up tinfoil, you're sculpting. Now that we've got about half the tinfoil on, you can start to see what I'm sculpting. Here we have some raised nostrils. The skull is not sitting down. It's actually canted this way. We've got a beautiful orbit happening here with a heavy bony ridge. We see the eye socket. We see the cheekbone dropping down into this region. The teeth will be inserted into this bony muzzle-like ridge. The teeth will probably go all the way back to here. The hinge point for the jaw is way back here, as it typically is in reptiles. And you can see the horn is starting to erupt off the back of the skull and shift into a helical turn. Now, we're thinking we're going to break that horn off. We want this to look like an ancient dug-up monument or it's a, an old skull, and it should have some battle damage into it. Probably something killed this guy. So we'll actually break and shatter the end of this horn. Generally, the composition's really nice. We've got a big sweeping movement. You see a slow undulating line of flow through the whole piece. So I'm going to continue to add tin foil, but you can see what we're looking for now. I need to fill out the back of the skull. I need to fill the base of the horn in so it looks like a huge horn. And then I might clean up this area here. So we're very close to putting on Paltaya. Almost everything is established. We've got a really beautiful horn that we're going to shatter the end of. We have a beautiful sweep going on. All the structure has been identified. But now we have to accommodate the thickness of Paltaya. So we now have to compress the sculpture and get rid of any loose ends. So anything that's loose or even a slight bit wiggly, we must secure it down. Because this sculpture has to be weight-bearing. The Paltaya on it can get quite heavy, especially with things like a horn sticking out over here. So spend the time. Take about a half hour if you need to. And when you've done that, there's final compression. Final compression is where we make sure this thing is symmetrical and we make sure that surface is tight. So this is the final size. Now with the tin foil, we start to slowly compress the shapes. Tinfoil quickly becomes almost rock hard on that surface. And so you make any corrections that you need. If it's not symmetrical or you want to add a little detail, and just press and press and press until the whole surface drops about a quarter of an inch or five mil. 
and go over the sculpture a couple of times. If something's wiggly or something loose, that is not a good idea to keep it there. We've been able to finish our tinfoil. So we have a really nice, strong, robust sculpture. And so you can see, you are genuinely sculpting with tinfoil. And you're able to get all the sweeping movements, the, the volume, the shapes, everything ahead of time. This took us about, I think, an hour just to put this together. Now we're going to start mixing up paltaya. We're going to use this because we're going to make a lot of paltaya. Paltaya can be mixed by hand. But again, for large volumes, that's just a lot of work. So, we're going to start by putting four cups, four level cups, and almost, but not quite, one cup of water. So it's a four to one. So we fill it up to one cup. We pour most of it in, but leave a little tiny bit of it out, just in case. Now, this can kick up some real dust. So we get a fairly large towel and we drape it across so it completely covers the bowl because we don't want this towel getting caught up in the spindle. Then, turn this on to about there for about 10 or 15 seconds. There. Now we take it off and it's not kicking up any dust. It's already been pre-moistened. Now we're going to watch this and we want this to a certain consistency. In this particular first batch, I need it to be smoother. Now we let this mix for about four minutes because I want a really creamy consistency. Now, especially for this first batch, it's to cover the whole thing quickly in about five mil of clay. And so we'll have to build make four or five batches to cover the whole thing. And then, when that's established, then you sculpt details on top of it. We have the clay. Now, I've made it really soft and smooth. And I'll show you what it truly does. As you can see, it does that. So it has a fabric-like consistency to it. What we're going to do is we're going to put a core over everything. So I'm going to flatten this to about oh, a quarter inch thick. And I'm going to lay it on here and press it aggressively into this tinfoil. Now the great thing is, tinfoil has that lovely corrugated, rough, textured surface, which means paltaya will stick on it on a completely vertical surface and even upside down. Again, quickly make five mil, slap it on, and just make sure you're not making it any thinner than five mil. Because at that thickness, you will be able to stand on the sculpture. It's impossibly strong. If you correctly cure this material with water over a couple of days, it's eight times stronger than ordinary concrete. If you want to check your thickness, just do this. Yeah, that's about a quarter inch thick. And it smooths right back down again. Jam it into all those crevices. Now, before I finish up, I don't know how far I'm going to get on the sculpture today. So what I need to do is prepare the sculpture and that surface for texture later on. For that, you need the fork. Even if I accidentally left the sculpture for, say, two months, and I wanted to come back in and finish it, I can because this texture is there. So if you're not sure, always, always, always take the time to make a very deep, firm, raked texture. I am raking along the lines of flow. Always make sure that when you're doing your raking, you know the direction that you want the sculpture to move in. And you can see, there's a lot of almost water-like movement. There's no straight lines on this. 
we have now got the entire sculpture covered. And I've made my fifth batch, which has four, four cups, makes about that much. So it's a nice small amount. I can use this pretty quickly. Now the temperature has begun to rise in the room that we're in here. It's taken us, at this point, we're at the three hour mark. So we've been able to completely sculpt the entire piece and make five batches of Paltaya, cover the whole thing, and now we could step away from this, come back tomorrow, come back next week, and work from there. But we're going to push through tonight. But with the temperature rising, this is going to get a little firm. And we have to keep moisture on the surface. Trust me, spray bottle. This should always have a sense of just moisture present on the surface, but lightly. So while it's fully exposed to the air, keep in mind that you have to nurse it with some water. I am going to finally play with some detail. So this batch is a little stiffer. Now, I like that because I'm going to be building some spikes up around the eyes, and I want them to look gorgeous and aggressive. First thing we're going to do is we're going to get a thin batch, and we're going to drive it into that surface. Now, if you had waited two weeks and this surface was dry, you should have made it completely wet before you attempt this. Because what will happen is you'll drag the water out of this clay into that surface, and this will become crumbly. But now that I've just sprayed this, there's plenty of water on that surface, and so it's going to share it. So I make sure that that gets ground into that rich, heavy texture that we established before. And I'm going to go out to about as far as I think I can get in this one batch. Now I love sculpting dragons. So we are going to make a rich, rich, interesting surface right around the eyes. Again, grind that in there. Because that's what keeps it all together. There are some of you who are going to be working in the northern latitudes, like Canada, Alaska, Norway. And you want this to be able to survive one of your winters, which are pretty considerable. By making sure that that is in those details, if this begins to experience a freeze, it can't come apart. Okay, we have a beautiful face here. I think I can move about that far. So I'm going to start with a scale about right there. Pinch it off, roll it down, and See, I'm making these little leaf shapes. And I'm going to make a scale right about there. And right there. So you can see this, is a gonna, this sculpture is going to get thick. So that 5 mil you started with, in some, in some cases, is going to get very thick indeed. That's fine. The more of this you put on, the stronger. So I'm putting very simple, globby little shapes, but the drama is starting to appear. Now I like the idea of this sweeping up and around, so I'll keep the scales moving in that shape. Now I'm only going to lay in the heaviest of the scales, the ones that have the most aggressive textures. The others I can simply draw on, but the big ridge here, I like the idea of these going this way, and those kind of go that way, so there's a sense of a radial movement. I've been doing this for 20 years, so I know where I'm going. But the techniques themselves, they're easy. As you can see, I mean, this is stuff you can do in your kitchen. Now I'm going to use this fine trowel, this beautiful trowel meant for um, oil paints. Now I'm going to clean up these scales. It doesn't take much. Go around the corners like this, and suddenly that's a finished scale. Here, these guys, this region I want to establish all at once. Because you can see how they all kind of work together harmoniously. That's hard to do a bit at a time. And the brush, crush that brush out. Make sure it's just slightly damp. And now we're going to pounce this on the surface. And what that's doing is it's blending your edges. See, instead of having all these fuzzy, furry edges, 
it's softening them and it's getting rid of a lot of unnecessary detail. Now, it's certainly possible that you can do this so much that you'd obliterate even the best of detail. So you don't do this too often. I use a brush right at this point, after the initial troweling, just to get an idea of what my shapes are doing clearly. Now, it's become a little soft. So now I'm going to run back over the scales one more time, just giving them a harsh edge and cleaning the top. See? Smooth the top. And suddenly the shapes become crisper again. And I pierce those. That's called piercing, by the way. When you drop a nice dark area in, the more piercings you can add, the more light play is happening on the surface. I'm going to walk away from it because I want it to stiffen up a little bit and I can start carving in more crisp detail if it's firmer. You can see I've got a lot of variety of scales. I have an enormous scale here, but right next to it I've got a scale that's about 10% of its size. So keeping all of these things moving at all these different angles gives it vitality. So this is only 5 mil thick. I'm going to finish this area right now. Now the underside of a palette is inherently smooth. Grind it into that surface so there's no air pockets buried underneath. Then just make some nice sweeping lines like this. Now I'm going to set where the teeth are going to go in. Now the teeth are going to go all the way from there to probably here, but we're going to deal with this region most importantly first. I've created a thickened ridge of our clay paltaya here because on reptiles the teeth insert. So grabbing our pencil we are going to do that and we're going to make a beautiful large connection for the teeth to be inserted into. Now you see how that bulges out? That's correct. When a skull comes along it bulges up around the teeth. So we're going to make a couple of these. Now they have to also follow the lines of flow. So these are not absolutely perpendicular. They're kind of curving out of the jaw. Again, let's give a nice, lovely, rich connection to these guys. And by doing that, you can see I don't have to sculpt in those lumps. It's absolutely given to me by free. Okay, now we're going to add some architecture. We need something to be happening here because, of course, there's this ridge here, but it disappears on that side. So all of that cool, fun stuff, you can't see. So something should be here to uh, play with the eyes. So I can either make a big eruptive horn, so the horn just plants itself into the back of the skull, and you have these gnarly attachment points, or I can do it as a sweeping, elegant skull. Or I can put a big, huge dorsal ridge on it like this. Oh, okay, I kind of like that. Essentially, I've got a large, dark mass here. It's dark because it's deeply pierced. I've got a slightly dark mass here and a very dark mass there, and it's flat in here. You don't want it too flat. You want it just delicately pierced with a couple of items of interest. So I'm going to add just some, essentially, mid-tones. That's a dark tone, smooth as a light tone. What I've done is this one, I've curved the radial point. So this is going radially from it, as those are, but it contacts like that, and it makes that transition a little less harsh. Hello, and today is the second day that we're working on our our dragon skull. Now I've just taken the plastic off of this because of course we wrapped it up last night and I'm looking at where the texture is right now. It has the texture of soft wood. You can still scratch it, you can still carve into the surface. This is the point if you wanted to get very very crisp lines you can scratch them into the surface and it'll stay. It's very be beautiful. But since we have also made sure that this is completely raked, the next layers that we put on now are completely going to grip that first surface.
Um, we have decided that this is going to be a dragon skull rather than a dragon or even a statue of a dragon. So we will not be filling in the eye socket with an eye, and we are going to bring back the details that we had done here and show the rooting of where the teeth go in. First thing we're going to do is we're going to set up a panel here that the teeth are going to rest on. We do that with tinfoil. No surprise there. And I'm bringing this up to where the root, the teeth are going to come right out. So those teeth are going to sit right on top of that. This batch I've made a little stiffer than our first couple of batches. Now to start off with, we want a really good connection inside those teeth. So we're going to take a small amount and we're going to just make a little wet patch deep inside there. Now teeth have a flow. They don't just stick up inside the, the bones of your skull. They always enter a slight curve and I'm keeping in mind the sweeping movements of this. So when that comes down, there should be a slight arc to it that follows through the tooth. A straight tooth means you're not doing it right. So now I've got the teeth in. And you can see that they are all different heights and shapes. There's a certain flow that I'm looking for as this rubs out. So it sweeps down, comes back gently. So I like that general shaping. They're all not brutally uniform. They're all sticking out of the same direction. Now I'm going to quickly sharpen them up a little bit, meaning get their shapes almost established. We'll keep coming back to them as they firm up over the next hour. One of the reasons we sculpted this region initially is that when you're doing reptile scales, this can read as both surface scales and as the skull underneath. Because, on, of course, on reptiles, there's very little difference. There's not a lot of skin over this area. Anywhere there's muscles, of course, then you have the scales laying on top of flesh. Since we've just this morning decided that this is going to be a skull and not, say, a desiccated <laughs> dragon head that's been partially mummified like a, a mastodon in, in the Siberian ice fields, we're going to shrivel it all up, we're going to rip the flesh off of it, and we're going to go right down to the bone. This will still read as bone, but this area will be different. We certainly now have to show the teeth roots. So, I'm going to make long roots like that, so we truly see those roots diving into the bone itself. Now, I also like the idea of him having a pincer beak, um, like a, a triceratops. They had a beak rather than just teeth, and I think that's just really handsome. It brings out a bird-like quality to them. So I'm going to take the peak of this nose, and I'm going to lift it up a little bit. Also, I like the idea of a extended flare on the nostrils. When you're putting this, bra this brush on here, notice I'm pouncing it, pounce, 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 pounce. I'm not smudging it. That you use only selectively. Pouncing lets you keep all the architecture that you've created there without smashing it one way or other. It stays clear and sharp. Now I'm also, you see, I'm going over those teeth. Those teeth are firming up really nicely, but I don't want all that smudgy detail that down there around them. You see, I added, added that other tooth in, and it just works fine. Now, this is a lovely final texture for a skull. Now, every area needs at least three textures on it to be vibrant. Um, but that's one of the first crucial textures is pouncing with a brush. Okay, we're nearly finished with our dragon skull. I have been going through and cleaning up every one of the scales and giving it that facet on every single one of these. We've got a lot of drawn and shape, and we're using the final tool. If you're going to be doing a, um, a dragon skull, and you want that porous look, and it's hard, just go through and start hitting that sculpture randomly, move it around, and it will start to pick up this beautiful texture. And you can hit it pretty hard of that porous bone. 
and that will give it a lovely, lovely final look. I'm not do doing it on the teeth, because the teeth have to be polished up to a, an enamel-like finish. But anywhere else, if this is going to be a fossil, it should look corroded, and ancient, and essentially pretty brutalized. We have now just finished our dragon skull. As you can see, it is pretty much complete. Um, it's taken us a few hours to get this thing built from start to finish, and at this point it's going to be cured. We will take this and we're going to keep it wet for the next minimum five days. And then after that we can paint it, and you can put it outdoors for as long as you like. So it worked out really well. This is a beautiful piece. And thank you for joining us.